Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Alrighty. Great games at your table. This is Jonathan Alvin, and it is Nikos RPG, tonight's Game Master's Toolbox. We're going to be talking about the Nikos Launchpad, and uh, in a much more general term, we're going to be talking about why your game sessions are more important than you know. Now, to give you a little bit of background on me, if you haven't seen any of my videos before, I'm Jonathan Alvin. I am a Game Master J, and I've been Game Mastering for very nearly 50 years. I have run role-playing games since I was 11, an average of one session per week for 48 plus years. So I've got some expertise in the subject of which we are speaking. So uh, we are going to actually be going over uh, the points here in a minute, but I wanted to uh, give you a couple seconds to catch up and welcome to the show. I am uh, excited to be here tonight, and I've got a lot of things I want to cover. So let's get started, shall we? Alrighty, so getting down here to my session title, as I said, a uh, game is more important than you know, and that has everything to do with the fact that a role-play game, as is, as in the case of every game, is a learning experience. And whether it provides you practical experience for other parts of your life or whether you focus it only on the enjoyment of the game itself is all up to you, of course. But I'm going to explain to you some things that might be able to give you some insight <clears throat> on how your role-play game can influence other parts of your life and such. And the reality is, is that the secret to utility for games in being useful for your life in any general case is by having an active imagination. Uh, I know that when I was a, a young man, I was often accused of having an overactive imagination, which meant that I was, you know, seeing stuff when it wasn't there, so to speak. I was envisioning realities that hadn't yet happened. And that, I think, was one of the major causes for me becoming a storyteller because I had already, you know, had this propensity for creating something out of nothing. But I think you're going to see that when we, as we go through these various points, that active imagination is really critical to uh, every facet of the game experience. So first of all, when we think of role-playing games, and in my case, uh, in particular, I usually or generally play in what's considered to be a theater of the mind environment, where I give narrative descriptions to the players about where they are, what they're doing, what the positions are, how close they are to other people, and all of these in intricate details to allow them to visualize and perceive of where they are in the story. Now, recently I had uh, a conversation with uh, a dear friend talking about uh, the issue of, uh, I think that it's, called, it's called aphasia, that there are certain people who don't have the ability to, well, just like that, they, they, they lose their focus. No, they don't, they're not able to visualize. That's weird. Come on, focus. There we go. Um, so they have difficulty with visualization. Now, in um, all of the years that I've been a game master, I have, I have yet to experience a person at the table who... Uh, overtly said that they had a difficulty with visualization and I pride myself on being able to, even in conditions where there is some ambiguity to provide forms of clarity in game that allow for the players to have a greater potential uh, perspective, a greater understanding of what the scene is. But the, the real issue here is that the visualization process that happens in every one of our own minds is just a matter of intaking the data, the information that is shared with us, and making it useful to ourselves for resolving whatever conflicts or whatever are ahead of us. And to a greater extent, I think that visualization is probably one of the places where the current role play marketplace may be actually missing the mark because it has become so detail oriented in terms of what other people suggest you should see when you are playing a role play game what 
the monsters look like and such that they actually deprive the player of their own uh, imaginative propensity. Now, I've heard it argued both ways, and I'm certain that I will have others that will chime in uh, either way. Uh, I am also, if you aren't aware, on the Discord channel that is listed down below. So if you want to uh, chat with me or carry on a conversation, feel free to hop on to do that as well. Oops. Wrong place. Okay, there we go. So um, I'm now set up so should any of you that are viewers that are also happen to be page patrons of my Patreon program or are uh, already have access, feel free to jump onto the uh, Discord and uh, give me some feedback as we're going along because, of course, uh, I do far better in dialogue format than I do in monologue format. But I do want to get through the points of this because I do think it's really critically important that you know as a game master, as a storyteller, even as a person who just uses storytelling in your career, your active imagination, your ability to think on the fly and adjust the, your perspective uh, to help other players and other persons see what you're trying to say is absolutely, absolutely critical. So um, beyond just the visual perspectives, which is, I mean, it's huge to be able to describe something and have others be able to play off of what they see. That's, that's powerful. But role-playing is more than just seeing and experiencing vicariously. It's actually learning how to communicate and have dialogue both within the game between the players, but also with the uh, non-player characters, uh, recurring characters and such that they, the players will run, in, run into. And this communication and dialogue exercise literally is that. If you are role-playing, you are speaking in the character. Now, some players want to go so far as to have a vocal affectation or they want to have some kind of visual tick or whatever. And that's that's it, not admirable and you know well and good, but it's not by any stretch required as long as your ability to communicate and have dialogue improves over time. And so role playing is an access to an exercise regimen that will improve your communication skills. Now, some would argue that if you're playing in a fantasy setting, then using forsooth and thou's and these and everything are, are you know would, would detract from your ability to communicate re reasonably with normal human beings but generally players tend to play in the first person in common dialect and therefore there's not a lot of that issue to be concerned with uh, it also is an ability for us to identify, define, and describe our actions to others. It's it's a far cry from a live action game where you actually you know pick up a bow and and draw back and shoot an arrow. Far different from that from the role play aspect of a uh, game. And so by learning to identify, describe define our your actions in game you're now not only learning a le level of articulate communication but you're also expressing action and therefore eliciting to the game a level of energy that wouldn't be there if it was a tabletop uh, miniatures game uh, it wouldn't be there if it was a board game instead you're able to add an intensity level because you're actually defining it in terms that the other players can interact with. This level of exercise can vary. Of course, every storyteller has their own means and methods for communicating it. But when you have a role-playing mechanism like Nikos RPG, it's all about the description of what it is you're attempting to do, which skills you're trying to elicit, and what kind of an outcome you're looking for, because all of those play into which dice are rolled and, and whatever when it comes to a die roll. But mainly the role play is in the description and the conversation. This means you have to have a pretty precise understanding of your situation. You need to be accurate about the terms you're using. You need to be able to be concise about how you're saying it and to be precise. And all of these are, again, a challenge 
that role play provides that may not be touched on by other venues or genres of, of games, other mechanistic uh, partitions, so to speak. So, if, as you can see, the the ability to mentally encapsulate what you're trying to say and then put it out there for uh, perusal and acceptance by others at the table, it necessarily will make you a better communicator and will bring a level of these things to your presentation, which, of course, will apply whether you're in or out of game. Now, this also leads to when you're talking about in a game environment, you have to develop concepts of patience, politeness, propriety in the game. Now, the subject matter might be in, uh, uh, indelicate. There, there may be, you know, uh, rough language and such in the actual play of the game, but being proper as far as whose turn it is, understanding that if somebody else was talking, you shouldn't talk over them, the ability to hold your peace until you have a moment to speak. These levels of patience, politeness, and propriety really make uh, for a well-oiled role-playing experience because, yes, we certainly don't speak like that. We do talk over each other in constant fashion in our modern world. But in terms of the expressing of the dialogue of a session, it sure certainly makes things easier when we're able to hold to these levels of uh, basically public politeness and patience with others at the table. Now, one of the what I find really fascinating is that in the early days of Dungeons and Dragons, in the early days of role play as a um, hobby form, there were a large number of people who said that well, people who play role play games are socially inept or are nerdy or you know, fit into a variety of epithets. Well, the reality is is that group involvement and social presence are actually tested more, I would argue, in a role play group than they are in our culture as a whole. Now, does that mean that they are played out equi equitably? No. The idea that a group involvement will make a player socialized to a group, though, is a far cry from the same individuals who, if they did not, did not have that mechanism, would never learn those things. So while we were marginalized or pigeonholed or defined uh, sort of like you see in uh, television programs like Big Bang or Stranger Things, the idea of a group working together to accomplish goals was universally helpful in, to the game players, and it really taught them ways of communicating that were socially helpful. And the more we embrace a larger group of players with a, a varied background and such, we have to increase rather than decrease our abilities with these skills. And so therefore, granted, there is not, there's no longer the gatekeeper function of a games group per se, as there was in the past. There's certainly been a lot of stigma removed, but the idea here is that you're still being tested on a Play, player by player, game by game basis on whether or not you can can deal with the group that you've been uh, that you've been put together with. Uh, that, now, this of course, when you're in a role play game and you're playing, a, especially a, a moderately sized group, somewhere between four and ten players, public speaking, public presence, and public express and expression are all tested as well because you can't uh, convey information as a wallflower. You're not, you need to be able to express yourself, even if it's just to the small group. And even if the game master doesn't uh, put, like, put you in the hot seat. Now, my, my methodology or my modality for role play is to uh, provide a player a platform to uh, provide, yeah, provide the players a platform to become their persona and play them out in the, in the character life. But inevitably, they will be in a position where they have to talk in front of a group or they have to uh, stand up to a bully or uh, challenge a 
skeezy politician or whatever. And the idea is that these levels of public interaction actually will improve the personal's interaction. Even if, they, even if they're hiding in the veil behind their character, even if they're, they're not actually stepping to the front, but it's their persona that's stepping into the front, nonetheless, they're picking up the physical skills. And this is, this is really important, too, because when we go from a small social group to another small social group, we can certainly see the parallels and see where our lines of propriety might be, and therefore we can actually step to the plate more often than we might otherwise. Role play games additionally, and I think this is a big one, take into account not only the actual visual conditioning, the, you know, the uh, description of the scene and all of that, but it also takes into account the nuances and positional commentary, it gives a level of situational awareness relative positioning and distance perception in the game. Now, as I mentioned before, somebody who might have aphasia might have difficulty with perceiving. And that's why in the Nikos RPG, your, your combat weapons ranges are threefold. You have at uh, you know extreme ranges, you've got archery range. So you're just shooting and it's really not even melee. It's not even combat because you're firing as something that really cannot threaten you yet. Then you've got your hurled ranges, which are basically the distance you could throw an item. So anything from a, a knife to a potato. Uh, holga, holga. But the idea is that your um, player's situational awareness comes into the game because you're able to then pick up on nuances and clues given by the game master in the description that bring you to make the conclusions and, and decide on actions that are specifically tied to the conditions that you find yourself in. And this really helps us uh, beyond the game in our ability to catch nuances in regular conversation, right? We're able to see what the person is trying to drive at and perhaps see verbal traps and uh, misspe misspeaking and things like that in advance so that we can uh, catch those flaws or whatever. Role play also, and I think this one's incredibly powerful, is that when you step into a role, you are stepping into another person's life and therefore you necess necessarily have to experience at least some form of empathy, some, some altered percent, uh, perception and perhaps consideration for the conditions that are in place. And all of these are absolutely helpful when we're dealing with social negotiation, between, especially with people we, with whom we don't necessarily do, agree. Without a role play background, certain people may never have gotten a chance to sound off and hold their ground and be more than who they are in real, you know, in real life. The idea here is that you're able to pick up on things in a new way because you're no longer considering things from your own perspective, but from that of another. Now, to close this out, imagination, if you go back and look at each one of these, imagination is the conduit for them. We can't really visualize unless we can imagine. We have to be able to define the things that we see in terms that we can engage with. We have to learn to communicate as if we are in that particular place. So we're having to imagine the framework, the very mode of communication. You know, are we speaking the same language? Are we sharing a cultural uh, parallel? All those things kind of come into it when it comes to dialogue. Our ability to identify our actions, well, that's uh, patently useful in just about every situation to be able to, uh, with clarity and brevity, define, identify, and describe our actions. It, it's essential if you're going to be a teacher of any sort. Uh, our ability to maintain accuracy and acuity and precision during such descriptions and such conversations also adds to our ability to uh, interact at all levels and therefore, again, 
ability, the ability to imagine where you are and then transfer that information from that place is really, really important. The ability and imagination to say, okay, I know that this is a narrative conversation and there are two of us involved, but there are four people in the room, so I am going to be polite and I'm going to give some time to the other players to interact and such. It's, it's critical and important and it helps us to become better social beings. Now, this also leads to a better group involvement. Our ability to see ourselves as part of the community is definitely an essence, a essential piece of an active imagination. Even speaking in public, sometimes we have to perceive of an audience to which we are speaking so that we can identify who in that uh, group we might be specifically targeting and therefore will make us a better communicator. And of course, taking on a role lets us become more empathic, more considerate of other people's positions. So I, as you can probably see, all of these things are tied to imagination. And so the Game Master's toolbox here is talking about the Nikos Launchpad. And the Nikos Launchpad is the secret weapon that provides the ability to regain an active imagination to build up your imaginative uh, assets, so to speak, and therefore make you a better storyteller, a better game master, and in, arguably from these points at least, somewhat of a better social human being. So having said all of that, I want to say thank you for being with us tonight. If there's anything you would like to talk about, feel free to put it in the chat box. I'll be here for a few more minutes. We are coming up on 1120, which is about the time that I anticipated I would be done with this. So I'm here for a few more minutes if you'd like to talk about any other subject. I do want to kind of get out of here before the commercials hit, so to speak, so you don't have to be burdened with those. Um, do remember that we broadcast every night at 11 p.m. I did note that we had two, two people online with us when we very first started tonight, so that was exciting. And tomorrow will be a episode of uh, Nikos News Network, and so we will have new information coming to you from the uh, campaign world of Nikos, and it'll be somewhat of an Easter egg basket, if you will, for my players uh, that are in campaigns currently, and more importantly, it'll be a great oversight for those of you that are not yet playing in the world of Nikos. So you might see an area that you might want to tell your role-playing story in. For more information on all of that, you can check out nikosrpg.com. There's also the lore site, which is nikosrpg.info. And of course, for information on how you can become part of the community, uh, check out patreon.com slash nikos, N-Y-C-O-S, like the logo says above. So thank you again, and I will see you next time. This is Jonathan Albin, Game Master's Toolbox.